Let's pray. Holy God, you call us together to reflect on your word and on our life in your world. Be with us now, be with Jess now, that together we may hear your voice and understand your way. This we pray through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate your prayer and your worship leading and your thoughts about friendship and about sycamore trees in Jericho and a little background information. That's good. It means I don't have to do it. No, that's good. And thank you, Rachel and worship team. That's meaningful this morning. There's a lot of lyric in our singing today. I hope that that spoke to you as well. And thank you, Danae, for children's time this morning. Appreciate it. So the first slide I have this morning, I love this slide because it's relevant to everybody. Jesus says, in this world, you will face struggle and difficulty. Can a brother get an amen? But he also says, take heart, be encouraged. I have overcome the world. I need that. With whatever the struggle is, maybe it's watching a painful debate. Maybe it's something in your family. <laughs> Thank you, all right? Or maybe there's other things going on in your home. Maybe you're uh, monitoring the health of a loved one from a distance. Maybe you're sitting in the room with them. It could be lots of things, right? Maybe you're navigating a difficult job, difficult decision. Church, Jesus says to you, in this world, you will have some struggle. So don't be surprised. But also know that Jesus, through Jesus, you get help. So shifting to today's theme, years ago, I came across this book, Friendship Evangelism by Arthur McPhee. Anybody know Arthur? He's from Virginia. Actually goes to church with my, my dad and stepmom. And, you know, it's, it's a classic. So I was drawn to this concept again with our, our friendship series. And let me give you just a quick book report. So I think you'll find this interesting. So McPhee writes in his preface, he writes, both Christians and non-Christians are uptight about evangelism and witness. True? Many of us are uptight about witness. One reason, McPhee writes, one reason why is because of the unnatural, canned approaches that are so often recommended and used. Can a brother get an amen? So you're feeling what I'm saying. And McPhee wrote this in 1979. Interesting, right? So also in his preface, he writes, the best evangelism or the best outreach takes place in a context of mutual trust and respect. It takes place between friends. That's one reason I'm drawn to this book. That's the next slide, Sue. A couple other things McPhee writes. Someone has said that your greatest witness is your deepest relationship. That is something that needs to be stated over and over again. It is absolutely essential that we be reminded of that truth. Yet, it is commonly overlooked. For many, faith sharing is something that you do quickly, almost spontaneously. There's not the time for developing relationships. There's no attempt to identify with people. And one more paragraph from McPhee. 
many Christians ask, where can I find opportunities for witness? But the better question may be, how can I make opportunities for witness? And the answer is by cultivating relationships, cultivating friendships. I'll stop with that. Interesting book, interesting concept, and I think it's huge. And hence, a a good way to end a a little mini-series on friendship. And friendship is relevant. So I remember a friendship I had years ago when I was teaching in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And this guy wasn't a Christian, but he had people beating on his door. And we developed a friendship through, through teaching. And then after a while, we said, hey, let's, let's work out together. And I remember one time we were working out at this fitness center. And we were jogging in the, in the, on the track of the fitness center. And then just out of the blue, out of the health of our friendship, he goes, Jess, I know you go to church. You're a Christian. I got a question. I said, well, I'm like, now I'm starting to get nervous. Oh, no. You know, what's my friend going to ask? And he goes, Jess, is being a Christian a one-time deal, like being born again? Or is it something that you do over and over? So I'm jogging along with them, with my friend. And I said, I'll call him Tom. And I said, Tom, it's like this. At some point, it's probably good to make a deliberate decision to say, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus. But then I said, but it's never just a one-time deal. It's a process that you live into. You say yes to over and over again in a lot of different ways, in a lot of healthy ways. He was quiet. We jogged some more. And the big evangelistic people would say, Jess, that's your moment. You should kneel right down there in the gym. But we just kept jogging. Because he's my friend. And if he wanted to do that, if he wanted to pray together in that regard, we would have. Before we look at the Zacchaeus story in Luke 19, and, and I invite you to turn there in those beautiful new pew Bibles. Maybe this time, don't look at it on your phone. Hmm. But look at it, Luke 19, and one of the things I do in the preaching class is I say, pay attention what's going on ahead of time. So I'm looking at Luke 18, 35 through 43. Some of you are very familiar with this, with this text. In this passage, Jesus and his group are heading to Jerusalem, and before arriving there, they're approaching Jericho, and a blind beggar is there. And and I love how this blind beggar knows something's going on, and, and he wants a part of the goodness. So he starts yelling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the Jesus group, they're like, shut up, man. Ain't nobody got time for you, dummy. But he yells even louder. So Jesus, it says in verse 40, and let me read there. Luke 18, verse 40. Jesus stops, stood still, and then orders the man to be brought to him. And I love how he says, and he probably leaned down, got into this guy's space in a healthy way, and he says, what do you want me to do for you? Hmm. And like we told the baptism class this week, That's a relevant question for you and I as well. How would you answer that question if Jesus came to you in your space, in your life, in your lifestyle? Jesus said to you, what would you like me to do for you? Would you be ready with an answer? And if not, why not? Because Jesus is looking to help people. 
Anyway, the fellow says, I want to see again. And I don't think he just wanted to physically see again. I think he wanted to see again. I think he wanted to live. (sighs) I wanted, I believe he wanted to enjoy his morning cup of coffee. I think he wanted to enjoy seeing people. He wanted to live and to see. So this is all going on right before our Zacchaeus story. So it's the next slide I have. I believe Zacchaeus had heard about Jesus. And I think perhaps he knew this blind beggar or heard about him or perhaps heard about this healing. So he's curious. He's interested in learning more. I also suspect Zacchaeus didn't have a ton of friends. Now, you're looking at my picture. You're judging my picture because it's not as good as Dave Osborne's sycamore tree picture. (laughs) Because that's obviously not a sycamore tree. But I don't know if you noticed in Dave Osborne's picture, but there were some palm trees in the background. Anybody see that? Let's look at Luke 19, 1 through 5. I'd like to make some observations. So Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man there was Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. So first of all, one thing I want to say is there's a ton of information on Zacchaeus. There's his name, his job, and a little bit later we learn about his size. There's a lot of stories in the Gospels where we don't even know the person's name. Why does he get so much attention? I think it's fascinating, and somehow it's important to the story. And then notice verse 3. I think this is important. If you want to be met by Jesus, if you want help by Jesus, I believe Zacchaeus puts forth effort. Notice what he does. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. Zacchaeus was not put off by one limit. He put out effort. Church, how bad do you want your faith to be met by Jesus? How bad do you want your faith deepened by having Jesus answer your questions. How bad do you want it? For some reason, Zacchaeus wanted it, and he puts forth effort. I love that. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he knew Jesus was going to pass that way. How many grown men, grown rich men, climb trees? It's kind of interesting to think about. But I'm struck by that. Jesus, excuse me, Zacchaeus is not stifled or stopped by his physical limitations or undoubtedly the negativity towards him. He faced it, pushed through it. We all have limitations. Amen? We all have limitations. We have obstacles. We have difficulties. But church, you're going to push through them? I mean, in this way, we don't think of Zacchaeus as a hero, but in some ways he is. He's pushing through that. And we can all learn from that. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Come down. I must stay at your house today. It's fascinating. So Jesus shakes up culture. He flips tables. He changes perspectives. He's also shaking up the role of guest and host here. He invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. Who does that? Flips that. Jesus flips things. 
And then looking at verses 6 and 7, it says, So Zacchaeus hurried down and was happy to welcome him. And then verse 17 is a bit of reality. All who saw it began to grumble. What? Religious people, Christian people grumbling? No. He's gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to turn people upside down. So I want to invite us to think about Zacchaeus and Jesus a little differently. What if, what if a lot of time happened between some of these verses? Say between verse 7 and verse 8. So verse 7 says, people are grumbling. Jesus goes and hangs out with Zacchaeus. What happens if they had several meals together and developed a friendship? What if, they, what if they just hit it off like David and Jonathan, like Kay told us about last week? They, they were just soulmates, so to speak. You know, some friendships happen fast, and you're just drawn to someone. Now, some people might be like, but Zacchaeus, the little dude who climbed the tree who ripped everybody off, Jesus would, would really resonate with him? What if? What if they hit it off? What if they both brought open-mindedness and honesty and authenticity to their relationship? What if in the source of, in, in the quick time Zacchaeus and Jesus had together, because of this open-mindedness and, and authenticity, Zacchaeus could go, Jesus, I like your way. Hmm. It makes sense to me. I've been a real jerk. Church, that's an example for all of us. At times, all of us have been a real jerk. And yet we're loved and befriended by Jesus. Hmm. Next slide. Because of Zacchaeus' friendship with Jesus, Zacchaeus genuinely repents. Genuinely, authentically, not some flim flamsy, I'm just going to say one word to get a person off my back. A real repentance. And then he participates in an impactful restitution. So powerful and deep is his friendship with Jesus that he's changed and he changes the community. What? That's awesome. Let's peek at that. Chapter 19, verse 8. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, hmm, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I'm going to give to the poor. And if I defrauded, and I'm sure if there were some Jews around, they go, if, <laughs> if. He says, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay them back four times as much. An impactful restitution coming out of a genuine relationship that also had repentance. Love that story. And then Jesus says, today's salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man came not to seek, seek out. For the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. Mm, that's beautiful. So the next slide here, I just want to name. Hmm. Not all friendships 
Not all relationships end up with dramatic victories. Can you breathe that in with me? That's a reality in our broken world. Now, it can be easy for us to get the impression that God is only about the big, the spectacular, the miraculous. And we read about many of those in scriptures, in the scripture. And I think that is to encourage us not to give up. But church, actually witness, like friendship, is more often about the small things and sticking with it. Sticking with it. Apologizing when you need to. Making some adjustments here and there. I saw a friend in Ohio, and he was not everybody's favorite person in the community, but I lived close to him, and, and we developed a friendship by proximity of where we lived. And, and my goal was not just to get him to come to church as a pastor. I was a pastor at that time. My goal was to have a friendship with him and to meet him where he was at. Yeah, he might have showed up to church a time or two. Um, he and his family did show up for my wife's, first wife's uh, funeral. They were there, the whole crew, and that spoke volumes, if you know about that kind of thing. So anyway, the friendship was about a lot of small things. I remember one time the police were at his house and I, he got in some trouble and I remember visiting him in jail. And then he was out for a short time before he was potentially facing a really serious situation and I could tell he was broken. I didn't know if he would kill himself or not. And I didn't know, and it's not my responsibility to keep that from happening. But as his friend, I could do something. And I remember saying, hey, we need to do lunch sometime. And he kind of like, meh, meh, whatever. But I finally kept bugging him in that short period of time. And we went out to lunch. He didn't eat too much. But we were together. He could see that he wasn't alone. He's still living today, and I thank God for that. Maybe the small thing that I did with that friendship helped. I like to think that. But I think it's about the small things that we do with people that can make a big difference. So I want to conclude this message with two really different stories about small things, and they're from Mike Iaconelli's book, messy spirituality that's in the church library and, and, and worth it. Two different kind of things. But the emphasis is that witness, like friendship, is more often about the small things and paying attention to it. First story. At 76 years of age, Gertie became concerned about the young people in her church. I love that. We have people like that in our church. So she volunteered to help with the high school youth group. Mm, I love that too. What would you like to do? The pastor asked. I don't know, Gertie said. God and I will think of something. Gertie wasn't a speaker. She felt too old to play games. She didn't want to lead Bible studies or counsel at camp, but she had a camera. So she took pictures of every kid in the youth group, put them on flashcards, and wrote biographical information on the back of each. She memorized the picture and the information on each flashcard, then stood at the door to the youth room every Sunday night, and I'll say Wednesday night. As the students entered, she welcomed each one by name. At the end of the meeting, Gertie stood at the door again, saying goodbye to each person by name and promising to pray. Over the years, 
The church's young people discovered that Gertie had the Bible almost memorized. So they came to her with the questions and struggles of their young lives. Hmm. It's more often about the small thing. Second story. And this is a war story, so it might stir a few of you up. But a little known fact also about me is so my paternal, excuse me, my maternal grandfather, my mom's dad, served in World War II on a bomber. And he said the story in this last bombing raid, they were coming back. That's when he had a come to Jesus moment, and when he got back, he went into the ministry. Now, I still have questions about a lot of aspects of that story with my, my grandfather, who's no longer here. But the recognition is that God can help us speak to us in a lot of different ways. But notice here in this story, I'd like you to notice the small things that make a difference. During the last months of World War II, the British conducted daily bombing raids over Berlin. The bombers would take off from an airstrip in England and fly surrounded by smaller fighter planes, excuse me, fighter planes whose job was to keep German fighters from attacking the bombers, which were easy targets. One night after a successful bombing raid, and I say that with gritted teeth, as they were headed for the safety of England, the bombers were attacked by a large group of German fighter planes. Somehow, during the dogfight, one bomber found itself flying alone with no protection, and suddenly a German fighter appeared out of nowhere. The crew of the bomber watched as the German plane moved closer and closer until finally it was in range. Those in the bomber prepared for the worst and watched helplessly as tracer bullets began spitting from the fighter. Bullets whizzed by them over and over until thud, 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 five bullets slammed into the fuselage of the bomber near the gas tank. The crew braced for the explosion, but nothing happened. They could see fuel pouring from the bullet holes, but there was no explosion. Miraculously, they were able to make it back to their base and get safely off the plane. A few hours after they had landed, one of the mechanics showed up in the crew's barracks. He had found five bullets in the fuel tanks, crumpled but not exploded. He handed them to the pilot. The pilot carefully opened the shells, and to the crew's amazement, found each one empty of gunpowder. Inside one was a tiny wad of paper. When he unfolded the paper, he found a note which read, We are Polish prisoner of war, POWs, forced to make bullets in factory. When guards do not look, we do not fill with powder. Is not much, but as best we can do, please tell family we are alive. The note was signed by five, excuse me, four Polish prisoners of war. Five tiny bullets, and out of millions and millions of bullets made during the war, made all the difference for the crewmen of a British bomber. Actually witness like friendship, is about the small things. What can we do? So last slide. Church, let's keep the conversations and efforts about friendship and about witness. Let's keep them going. And let's be faithful in the small things. Let's pray. 
Jesus, thank you for your friendship with Zacchaeus. There's so much more to that story I'd like to know. But I am thankful for what we have and how Zacchaeus was truly seen by you and his friendship with you changed him. Jesus, you see us, you befriend us, you change us, you call us to befriend and witness to others. Help us to do that creatively and healthily. Help us in the small things, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.